um, everything's set to go. All right, Marty Burns by Telephone in Chicago. Marty, going to have you hang on there one moment. Again, just to recap for our viewers, it appears that Michael Jordan giving the strongest indications yet that he will return to the playing surface this year for the Washington Wizards. By the way, the Wizards open up at Madison Square Garden in New York City against the Knicks in late October. With us now from CNNSI, Fred Hickman joins us. And Fred, we've talked about this many times just between the two of us. Did it appear inevitable that Jordan would make this step? Well, in my mind, I think Michael's been coming back ever since we started talking about this some months ago. I think that, uh, you know, some words have been dropped here and there and the rumors have been going around. But I think in his mind, this is something that he's been wanting to do uh, for probably the last year or so. So I'm not really shocked by this. I guess the only thing I'm surprised by hearing is the fact that he's not is totally driven by winning championships and I don't know if I buy that even though we told that to Marty and the guys covered him for a lot of years and I'll tell you the one thing about Michael Jordan you don't win six NBA championships and five MVPs in those championship finals without having a burning desire to win it all so I think it's going to be a good influence on the other guys but I do think he wants to the, win. the indication he gave tonight with reporters like Marty was that he uh, quote unquote has matured and that he believes winning a championship could be equated given the situation the Wizards have been in for the past several years of not being a winning team, mm -hmm. just getting to the playoffs might be a victory in itself. Do you buy that? I, I do buy that, but I don't buy the fact that that's all he wants. I think he's going to be around, and Marty can speak to this a little bit more, for more, more than just the one season, and I think his goal is to build something special in Washington. Mm -hmm. Back to Marty Burns now by telephone in Chicago. Marty, how much longer will these workouts continue, and what more can you tell us about the workouts Jordan has undergone thus far? Well, they're scheduled to go to the end of this week. Uh, that's when all the players are going to break up and uh, head home for the training camps start in October. And um, that's where Michael's getting this uh, mid-September uh, date. You know, he knew that this would be breaking up at, the, at that time, that he'd be able to make his decision then. Uh, the games have been uh, played. They're very um, intense. Um, this isn't uh, summer pickup games uh, that you'd expect it to see at a rec league or something like that. They're officiated by NBA refs at times. Um, and the players are all high-level players like Penny Hardaway, Michael Finley, Antoine Walker, uh, Charles Oakley. Those are just some of the players who've been in the, uh, in the camp this week and in past weeks. And Marty, have you seen him work out in person? No, media is not allowed into the... At, uh, at any point over the past several months, no one has seen him work out. No, um, a few, some of the peeps, the, uh, some of the friends of players and that kind of thing, and uh, some of the management uh, personnel at the uh, facility mm -hmm. have been able to see him. And, you know, Michael, uh, out of respect for Michael, uh, his friends, his players uh, and most of these uh, spectators haven't um, talked about it too much but you do pick up little things uh, coming out of these uh, games and the word from some of the players and little comments here and there has been that uh, Michael's looked very good um, in recent weeks once his knee started to feel better and they say that uh, you know he that he looks really good and he's ready to play but Marty quickly here do they talk about him in terms of being the superstar we once remember him as no, they uh, they don't. I don't think anybody expects him to be the player at age 38 that he was when he was at when he was 32 or 31. But uh, they say he's a smarter player and that he can still get the job done. All right, Marty. Marty Burns by telephone in Chicago. Back to Fred Hickman again here at the CNN Center in Atlanta. When people talk about Michael Jordan walking on a court, it's quite likely he could go up against a guy like Allen Iverson, who is no doubt as quick as anybody you'll find. When people consider this, NBA analysts, coaches, the players with whom you speak, what do they say about the potential for those matchups? Well, I think that they're looking forward to those matchups, a number of players around the league, because I think that, you know, since uh, those three years have passed and kind of Michael's mantle has been passed along to other people, they feel a little bit put upon, and I think this is uh, challenging their uh, credibility as far as being the future superstars of the league. So I think we'll see some inspired efforts coming from those guys. And by the way, if you don't know a lot about the Wizards, you will because uh, both Turner Sports and NBC Television have the options now to pick up a lot more Washington Wizards games. I'd expect that We'd to We'd like happen. to hear that. Okay, Fred, thanks for your help tonight. Fred Hickman at well. CNNSI, Marty Burns by telephone in Chicago. Certainly this is not the first high-profile athlete who has come out of retirement to pursue his dreams and goals once again. Tonight, Tom Rinaldi, another high-profile Profile athletes who have returned to the playing surface. Jordan, open, Chicago with the lead. Well, that may have been the last shot Michael Jordan will ever take in the NBA. If that's the last image of Michael Jordan, how magnificent is it? It is not the critic who counts. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, 
who knows his place shall never be with those timid and cold souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Teddy Roosevelt, who wrote those words, never met Michael Jordan, but the words still seem to mark Jordan's mission. Yes, there's a lot to lose when you are already a statue, but Michael Jordan refuses to rust. done a half dozen encores, uh, brought the house down, and now after the curtain apparently fell for the final time, he's rushing back into the lobby, pulling the patrons back into the theater going, wait, 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 one more thing. It just doesn't feel right. He'll still be a very fine basketball player, but I doubt very seriously that he'll ever be able to live up to, the, uh, to what he was doing at the time when he finished, particularly that storybook finish with that last shot. Do I want him to do it? No because I would never want him to mess with the legacy, the things that made him be the best that's ever played. I would never want that to, him to, anything to go wrong. 13 seasons in Chicago, 10 scoring titles, five MVPs. He won a championship in each of his last six full seasons. The perfect ending. So why do it? Why risk failure? Why endanger a legacy in a comeback? Perhaps to serve the very same drive and desire that forged the greatest career in NBA history. He left the game, but did the game and its drive and desire leave him? You say he's 39 years old and he can't come back and do what he's done all through his career. I won't be the one to say that, you know? I mean, he knows what he, what he has inside of him. And he has one of the biggest hearts that ever stepped out on the dance floor. If Mike wants to come back, God bless him. I mean. You know, I know he's going to work extremely hard to get himself in shape and in playing shape to compete and to be the best. So when he wants to come back, God bless him. I wish him the best. In sports, career postscripts rarely read well. We see Willie Mays as a Met, Joe Namath as a Ram, John Unitas as a Charger. We shake our heads trying to clear the picture. But we also see Lance Armstrong in the Tour de France or Mario Lemieux on the ice, igniting their worlds and shining a glare on their sports all over again. I think the main thing is to prepare yourself uh, physically, first of all, and mentally, that uh, you're going to have some ups and downs uh, during your comeback. You're not always going to feel 100%, uh, and that's, that's the main thing uh, if, you, if you miss two or three years. Since retiring, Michael Jordan didn't leave the arena, literally. He could be spotted on occasion in the ozone of an owner's box, peering down from on high in tie and cufflinks. Perhaps he's trying to clear that picture. Perhaps he still has a need for victory again, at the immediate risk of defeat. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Rinaldi. And for more on this at this time, you can head to our website at CNN.com. And while there, head our quick vote. Should Michael Jordan return to play in the NBA? That's online right now. Cast your vote at CNN.com. And as always, AOL users, the keyword there is CNN. Much more to come here ahead on CNN Tonight. Ahead on CNN Tonight. Tonight. It's launched a controversy, but can it do more than burn billions of dollars? Two senators debate missile defense and money. It's much more than dirty pictures. It's ruining thousands of young lives. And it may be in your neighborhood. And from our You've Got to Be Kidding department, Jeannie Mose has the fashion world's latest ideas of what you ought to be wearing. As a National Car Rental Emerald Club member, you can bypass the counter, which saves time. Take the car of your choice, which saves time. And when Emerald Club members return their car, National will fill it up at gas station prices, which saves money and time. If we can give you 43 more minutes to enjoy Disney's newest theme park, Disney's California Adventure, then we've done our job. 43 minutes. How will you spend it? The Emerald Club from National. You can go your own way. The official car rental company of Disney's California Adventure in California. Post your resume now, monster.com. You the monster. 
This is a complete broadband solution with a nitro-powered on switch. This is igniting your mission-critical applications on the fattest optical IP pipe on the planet. This is your business, screaming a thousand times faster than yesterday. This is moving beyond connected. This is riding the light. This is the technology that makes it happen. Quest. Ride the light. Yes. What do you say to investors who are a little frightened of the current market? Is this a good time to get out? What if the downtrend continues? First, just relax. <laughs> when markets are down, we all get fearful about it. Investing is about the long term. If you have a few bonds in your account, a little bit of cash, a little bit of stock, you can weather almost any kind of a market. To learn more, call 1-800-3-SCHWAB today to sign up for our complimentary workshop navigating today's market. Sixty horsepower Acura CL Type S. Now to that struggling U.S. economy again today. The talk in Washington was what to do about certain budget issues, and whether or not Congress should take up the issue even further than already has. And in Washington, money and missiles on the agenda. There, salvos too over the Bush administration's missile defense plan being fired by some Democrats. CNN's David Ensor on Capitol Hill for us on this story. Sensing the centerpiece of President Bush's national security strategy, missile defense, may be politically vulnerable, congressional Democrats are on the daily attack, charging the system could be a waste of money, that it could lead to an arms race in Asia, starting with China. If the president continues to go headlong, headstrong on this theological mission to develop his missile defense system, if he does what he says and drops objections to China's missile buildup, not only will we have raised the starting gun, we'll have pulled back the hammer. Let's stop this nonsense before we end up pulling the trigger. The Bush administration, however, insists it will in no way drop objections to China increasing its missile arsenal. Late last week, on a party-line 13 to 12 vote, the Senate Armed Services Committee cut $1.3 billion, almost half, of the increase for missile defense requested by the president. It also voted to restrict missile defense tests that would violate the 1972 Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Democrats argue the more likely threats to the U.S. include biological or chemical attacks, using weapons smuggled into the country, not fired in missiles. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld said if the defense bill went through as it is, he would recommend a veto to the president. I, I have a hard time figuring out why some people want the United States to remain vulnerable to ballistic missiles. The Democratic attacks make clear that the administration cannot assume it will get all the funds it wants for missile defense technology research. And U.S. officials also grumble that it could inspire the Russians to have confidence and hold out for longer against scrapping or changing the ABM treaty. David Ensor, CNN, Capitol Hill. All right, tonight let's debate both sides. We're joined by two U.S. Senators with us late tonight in Washington. Jeff Sessions, a Republican from Alabama, agrees with Rumsfeld on the need for a new plan. Senator, good evening to you. Good evening. Good uh, to be with you. And thank you, sir. And also Jack Reed, a Democrat from Rhode Island who's concerned with U.S. spending on missile defense. Gentlemen, good to have you here. First to Senator Sessions, what about the basic argument that, listen, the economy's getting tougher, the budget's getting tighter. Could this money be better spent in Washington? Bill, we've got a $30 billion increase in the defense budget this year by President Bush. It's the biggest increase in over a decade, maybe 15 or 20 years. It's a very in important increase. It's going to have benefits for our men and women in term of, terms of pay and, and benefits, but uh, it has a $3 billion out of that 30 increase in what we plan to spend for missile defense, at least what President Clinton proposed, from 5 to $8 billion. Tell we us again, though, why that. this is so critical. It's critical because we will soon be vulnerable to attack by ballistic missiles from maybe a number of nations. 
The uh, un bipartisan report found a number of years ago that Rumsfeld chaired that we'd be vulnerable by 2005. CIA Director Tennant agrees with that. Uh, we uh, voted in the Senate uh, two years ago, 96 to 4, to deploy as soon as technologically possible a national missile defense system. President Bush has got a robust testing program, an intensive effort to make sure we're doing it right, and mm -hmm. it costs some money, and he asked for $3 billion more out of a $328 billion dollar Senator, budget. I think of, we can afford that. In the interest of time, I'm going to go to Senator Reid. I'm curious about this. You see, Donald Rumsfeld makes the point somewhat about image. He says, quote, the ability to project force is critical. Many would argue this is what helped tear down the Soviet Union of the 1980s. Does he have a point? Well, he has a point. In fact, we've increased uh, spending on ballistic missile defense by 37 percent from last year's authorization bill. We're committed to going ahead and, and developing uh, effective theater missile defenses and deploying them and developing uh, national missile defenses. What we're not uh, in favor of is wasting money on technology that's not proven yet. We want the Department of Defense, like every other department, to spend the money wisely to protect America. And we also recognize that there are other threats rather than missile threats that are dangerous to the United States, and we should concentrate also on those threats. Uh, so the proposal we've sent forward recognizes the need to develop missile defense, but wants to do it in a way that it will truly protect the United States and not mm. simply spend money. And curious on that point you just make, and I, I want to go back to Senator Sessions on this, and Joseph Biden, the senator, made the point as well. He believes it's much more likely that someone carrying a backpack across this border could unleash a, a flurry of chemical weapons, and that could be the more immediate threat. How well, do we respond we, to that initially, as opposed to what we're talking about when it comes to missile defense? Bill, that is possible, and we're spending an awful lot of money and doing a lot of things to prevent that from happening. But if we get into a eyeball-to-eyeball -eyeball showdown with a Saddam Hussein in 2005, and they have missiles that can reach the United States, and we have no defense whatsoever mm -hmm. to that attack, it will definitely undermine the ability of the president to act in our national defense. We have the technology and the ability to respond to that by deploying this system, and we really need to do that. And I think we're going to get the Russians to agree if uh, this action in the Senate doesn't sort of encourage them to uh, maybe uh, pull back a bit. And Senator Reid, don't you agree with that point, though, at some point some rogue nation could unleash some missile at some point, and at that point America is left vulnerable. Is it not possible that they could at some point take their best shot? Uh, they could think about taking their best shot, but they would know they destroyed their regime. Uh, just as today we have been able to maintain our uh, protection from intercontinental missiles because of our assured mutual destruction, our ability to wield a devastating counterattack, that uh, power still remains with us. Any regime, North Korea or any other regime, thinking about their future would have to think twice before launching a missile attack on the United States. We could identify the source of the threat and we could counterattack vigorously and decisively. The difference between uh, that type of attack and someone carrying across a, a suitcase full of biological weapons is that we be hard for us to retaliate. And that's one of the issues we have to consider. Mm -hmm. Indeed, in Iraq, we made it quite clear to Saddam Hussein that if he attacked with uh, nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction, we would use our retaliatory powers. And he did not respond in kind as we thought he might, Just because he understood that his regime would fall and he would fall. Well understood. I pardon for the interruption, but about 30 seconds left. I want to get both gentlemen on this. Senator Reid, how difficult of a sell will this be for the White House? It'll be a difficult sell because the technology for national missile defense is not ready to deploy. They want to deploy it prematurely. Also, it's difficult because it will undercut arms control. The idea that the administration is turning a blind eye in China's buildup is something mm -hmm. that turns the whole notion of arms control on its head. The final word to Senator Sessions here. I don't believe uh, this language is going to stay in, particularly the, the language that uh, holds on to the ABM treaty beyond all rationality, and I believe we're going to get more money in this bill. Uh, we're going to have to, and I have no doubt that it will not stand as written. Senator Jeff Sessions, Alabama. Senator Jack Reed, out of Rhode Island. Thank you, gentlemen, for coming on and staying up late with us tonight. Most appreciated. Thank you. Thank right, you. We'll talk to you again down the road. Coming up here on CNN Tonight, children and sex. Is your kid involved? All of these girls that were at my house uh, baking cookies, you know, 15, 20 of them that I know of, are out there selling their bodies. And their parents don't have a clue. The staggering numbers of exploited kids here in the U.S. when we come back. The new report is out tonight.
Tonight on Greenfield at Large, Bob Costas, one-on-one. -on -one. Where does reality end and packaging begin in sports or in politics? Is baseball an endangered species? Would another strike kill it? Has big money changed the Olympics forever? We'll ask Bob Costas on Greenfield at Large next. I'm Jan Hopkins with this Moneyline update. A disheartening session after Friday's brutal sell-off, the Dow today barely budged down less than a point to end at 96.05. The Nasdaq gained, but the rally was less than inspiring. The index rose seven points to close at 1695. In economic news, consumer credit virtually unchanged in July. Economists expected an increase. That stokes fears that consumers are pulling back on spending. Watch Lou Dobbs Money Line at 6 p.m. and 11.30 p.m. Eastern weeknights on CNN. Money Line Update is brought to you by Bank of America. Make banking work as never before. Why not? Bank of America. Grow. What is possible? Does achievement discriminate? Or does it open its doors to everyone? With posted pop-up notes in the handy dispenser, you always know where your notes are. So you won't go nuts looking for nuts. And posted pop-up dispensers also come in these cool colors. You go fishing every weekend, right? And you never catch a thing. It's not a bad no. ottoman. <laughs> What is going on? Armoire! <laughs> furniture, why is there furniture? Chafing dish! Chafing dish! I thought I told you to strap everything down. Coffee table! Morning commute. Catch! On the wings of Goodyear. Experts are warning that child sexual exploitation is rising in the U.S. In a report out today, those experts warn that 300,000 to 400,000 children here in the U.S. are victims of prostitution, pornography, and other types of commercial sex. It also concludes that married men with kids of their own are the most common perpetrators and that 96% of sexual assaults are committed by relatives and acquaintances. Tonight, CNN's Rusty Dornan has a look with one young woman who got caught up in the cycle of exploitation. Oakland police close in on a pimp, a man suspected of prostituting 14-year-old girls. Oakland police, search warrant! Show me your hands, show me your hands! Everybody hands the suspect wasn't home. Oakland police say they don't need a new study to know that child prostitution is rampant. The proof walks the streets. It's almost an epidemic. We have about 110, 120 girls in the last two and a half years that we've interviewed and identified as being child prostitutes. 75% of child prostitutes in the U.S. come from working or middle class families, according to the new study funded in part by the Justice Department. This 17-year-old girl knows she's from a well-educated family in Oakland, California. She says her boyfriend talked her into doing the unthinkable. A boyfriend of which she is now so frightened that both she and her mother don't want their faces shown for the interview. I was 16 when I got involved in prostitution. Um, a boyfriend of mine made slight comments of how beautiful I was, how much money guys would pay to be with me, how I could make more money than the next female, and I was really intrigued by that. At the beginning, it's always about love. It's always about I love you, so I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to sell my body. I'm going to sell drugs. I'm going to, you know, do whatever you ask me to do for love. She believed all the myths about prostitutes until it happened to her. It was something that only people that were low lives and females that had been raped or in and out of jail did. And then three or four years later, I was doing it. And it was sort of like I was still better than them because I came from a better family and I had more of a chance of making more money. Her mother found out a year later she was dumbfounded. All of these girls that were at my house uh, baking cookies, you know, 15, 20 of them that I know of 
are out there selling their bodies and their parents don't have a clue until I call them. And uh, it's more serious than you know and you don't see it coming. She took her daughter here, a recovery program for prostitutes in San Francisco called the SAGE Project. Former child prostitute director Norma Hodling says parents need to pimp proof their children. I become informed on the recruitment tactics of pimps and recruiters because they are at your children's parties, they are at the malls, they are hanging around the schools, um, they are the guys that the girls are becoming involved with. Hodling says the best way to keep your kids off the streets is to spend a lot of time communicating with them at home. Rusty Dornan, CNN, San Francisco. Unexpected guests say the most unpredictable things on Greenfield at Large next. Then join the team of Sports Tonight, followed by Lou Dobbs Moneyline on CNN. Great vacation moments are registered every day in Florida. See for yourself. Now that you've seen part of what we have to offer, ready to make some moments of your own? Great moments, great vacations. Florida, call now for your free Florida vacation guide. FLA USA. Water, its magic lies in its ability to alter shape and form. Not surprisingly, water is the ultimate symbol for change. How appropriate. Greater Fort Lauderdale, home to so much water, is also home to so much change. Immerse yourself. This is CNN. And finally, tonight, unusual people wearing quirky clothes. Perhaps a costume party? Maybe a play? How about Fashion Week in New York City and tonight CNN's Jeannie Mosk is making the most of it. It's another eye-popping Fashion Week and you don't have to be a happy camper to flock to these tents. Flawless. Flawless. Well, maybe not flawless. It's not just the models who have their eyebrows done. Your eyebrows are mesmerizing in this color. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm playing for the fashion crowd. Who isn't? You can bet almost everyone who comes to the shows thinks long and hard about what to wear. It's all stuff from the 50s, including the glasses. And though the most unusual outfits are reserved for the runway, some looks make you want to run away. Whoa, 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 whoa. He wouldn't talk, but young designers hoping to make it big are only too happy to say a few words. The name of the line is called Chan Paul. Okay, in one word, and my name is Paul Chan. Paul Chan says Chan Paul looks good as a logo. Entrance to the shows is by invitation only. I didn't get in. But Kim Cattrall did. The actress from Sex and the City was all smiles at the Patricia Field show. <laughs> Pat Field is the stylist for Sex and the City, so maybe someday we'll see Cattrall's character in one-legged trousers with leg irons. We understand why the editor of Vogue attends the shows, but an editor from National Geographic? The magazine has done a fashion book. This is fashion around the world and fashion through times. Read about outfits made of reeds, or South Pacific Islanders wearing fish, or this towering turban from Burkina Faso. A former UN diplomat wears different outfits with the same theme throughout Fashion Week. Zebras one day, stripes the next. I have a veritable zoo in my closet. You name it, I have it. In one sense, fashion has reached new lows. Yeah, they're Brazilian. It's like the latest trend. I've got lower ones, but I didn't, Do want, you to really? scare, I didn't want to scare the New Yorker. I mean, these are really low jeans. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and have to practically shave. Yeah. You have to shave? <laughs> yeah. But not the guy in the low riders with the lace-up fly. I no, I don't have that hairy problem. The laces go on the shoes, not on the crotch. <laughs> You're never too young to be fashionable. Let's see, let's see whose shorts you got on. Oh, Ralph Lauren, nice, very nice. Some guys like to let the band of their underwear show. That's his own little fashion trend because it's his diaper, it's not underwear. Lo and behold. Ginny Mo, CNN, New York. 
And with that, we've got to run. Thanks for being with us tonight. That does it for this edition of CNN Tonight. Our apologies again for not airing our promoted report on Alzheimer's. We'll bring that to you tomorrow here on CNN. Once more in our top story tonight, Michael Jordan does plan to return to the basketball court to play for the Washington Wizards officially.